Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing anxiety and anxiolytic drugs. Okay, right, so, we're in the process of discussing the anxiolytic drugs, okay, and the first class of anxiolytic drugs that we're talking about are antidepressant drugs, okay? Uh, so, uh, we've now discussed the monoamine systems, which are fundamentally the thing which the antidepressant drugs are believed to exert their effect through, okay? Uh, and the first class of antidepressant drugs that I want to discuss is a class of drugs known as the SSRIs. Okay, and this is a very famous class of drugs. Okay, so SSRIs, what does it stand for? It stands for selective, that's the first S. Okay, then the second S is for serotonin. Okay, uh, the R is for reuptake. Okay, and the I is for inhibitor. Okay, so these are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Okay, sorry, I always write inhibitors with double H effectively. Sorry, that should be an N, not a H. I know it looks like an H. So, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs. Okay, so let me give you examples of these drugs, and then I'll describe to you what they're actually going to do. And what they actually do is, to some extent, told within the name, okay? They're going to inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, and they're going to be selective for stopping the reuptake of serotonin, so they're not going to also stop the reuptake of some of the other monoamines. Okay, right. Uh, so, let me give you examples of these drugs. So, the most ex famous example of all is the drug fluoxetine. Okay, and you might be saying, well, <laughs> is that the most famous example of them all? Well, if I give you its um, commercial name, its brand name, then you'll suddenly recognize it, okay? Uh, fluoxetine's original brand name was Prozac, okay? And that's a very, very famous drug. Okay, uh, other uh, less famous selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors include peroxetine as well. So a lot of them do end with the suffix uh, exetine like that, zetine like that, okay? Um, then we've also got sertraline, okay, and also citalopram. Okay, so those are my four examples of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There are others, there's a huge number of them now, okay, but these are some of the main ones. Fluoxetine is the most famous, citalopram is very highly used, uh, so these are some good examples. Okay, right. Now, what do they actually do? How do they work then? Well, basically, the way that we believe that they work to treat both anxiety and depression, in fact, uh, is by raising the amount of serotonin in the brain, by raising the amount of serotonin that's being released onto all portions of the brain. And we don't understand why that actually helps to treat anxiety or depression, I'm afraid. Uh, in anxiety, we would think that maybe it increases the amount of serotonin going to the amygdala and potentially this modifies the function of the amygdala, but that's all that we have basically. Okay, right, so all that I can now t tell you about then is how do these drugs increase the amount of serotonin uh, in the brain. Okay, well they do it by stopping the reuptake of serotonin. So remember I told you that um, these serotonergic neurons they secrete the neurotransmitter serotonin out into the extracellular fluid, and the serotonin can now act on all sorts uh, of neurons, okay, in the local area. Well, in fact, they also reuptake the serotonin back from the extracellular fluid, okay? So on their membranes, they have transporters which move the serotonin back from the extracellular fluid into the axon terminal and the serotonin will then be repackaged back up into uh, synaptic vesicles. Okay, so this is a transporter for serotonin. It's going to move the serotonin back in and take it out of the extracellular fluid. Now, this transporter for serotonin is known as the serotonin reuptake transporter. Okay. And for short, the serotonin reuptake transporter is often abbreviated, whoops, um, how am I doing, transporter, is often abbreviated as the CERT, okay, so SE for serotonin, uh, R for reuptake, and then T for transporter, 
Okay, right, so I've coloured this thing in, well actually I haven't coloured it in in vivid purple, but never mind, I'll underline it in vivid purple. Okay, right, so this thing is uh, transporting the serotonin out of uh, the extracellular fluid and back into the serotonergic neurons axon terminal. So if we were to block this serotonin reuptake transporter uh, and stop it from functioning, then the serotonin would remain in the extracellular fluid and therefore the concentrations of serotonin would go up. That is what these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors do. They block the serotonin reuptake transporter, they stop it from functioning. The serotonin that has been released remains in the extracellular fluid and continues to act on the, um, on the um, neurons in that extracellular fluid for a longer period of time. Now, what I would like to just discuss with you is uh, the biology of the serotonin reuptake transporter in a little bit more detail. Okay, so basically it is a member of an absolutely huge family of transporters, okay? It is a member of what are known as the solute carrier transporters. Okay, now there are an enormous number of solute carrier transporters, okay? So many that they are divided into a huge number of different families, okay? The serotonin reuptake transporter is specifically in the solute carrier transporter family 6, okay? So there are a huge number of families of solute carrier transporters. We're going to talk about the solute carrier transporter family number 6, okay? Because this is the family of solute carrier transporters which the serotonin reuptake transporter is within. Okay, now for short, the solute carrier family 6 of transporters is uh, often abbreviated as SLC6. So SL is for solute, C is for carrier, and then it's 6. Okay, right, so we're going to talk about this SLC6 family of proteins. Now, there are actually 20 members in this family. So, you know, this is one family of a huge super family of solute carrier transporters. And in this family alone, you've got 20 members. Okay, and their naming is quite nice. Okay, they're named SLC6, solute carrier family 6 protein, and then you put an A afterwards. I'm not too sure what that A is actually for. Okay, and then you put another number. So you put SLC6A1, maybe it's just to separate the 6 and the 1, but you could have put a decimal point or something. Maybe there is a logic behind that, but I don't know what it is. Okay, so there's SLC6A1, that's the first member. Okay, then there'll be SLC6A2, SLC6A3, and then you go all the way up to slc 6A20. So those are the names of the 20 different members of this SLC6 family. Okay, now the serotonin reuptake transporter is just one of these members. So which number is it? Well, it's specifically SLC6A4. Okay, um, but there is a little, well, you can divide these 20 members of the SLC6 family of SLC carrier transporters um, into separate families still. Okay, so you can you know, you can classify things even further. You can split this family up into subfamilies. Okay, and one of the key subfamilies of the SLC6 uh, family uh, is the monoamine transporters. So in fact, uh, this SLC6 family of SLC transporters actually contains free transporters for the three different monoamines. So it doesn't just contain a transporter for serotonin, it also contains a transporter for dopamine and also for noradrenaline. So we might as well discuss this now because we're actually going to need the transporter for noradrenaline in a moment when we go on to some of the other antidepressants. Okay, so the monoamine transporters then. So let me just stress this again so that it's very, very clear. There is this massive, massive family of proteins known as the solute carrier transporters, the SLCs. Within the solute carrier transporters, there is then a family of the solute carrier transporters, which is the SLC6 family, okay, the sixth family. Within this SLC6 family of solute carrier transporters, there is then a subfamily, which is the monoamine transporters, and this subfamily contains three members, and the three members it contains are SLC6A2, okay, SLC 
6A3, okay, and also SLC 6A4. Now we know what SLC 6A4 is. That is going to be the serotonin reuptake transporter, or the CERT. Now, what are SLC 6A2 and SLC 6A3? Well, SLC 6A2 is the dopamine transporter. Okay, this uptakes dopamine. Okay, so it's a very similar story for the axon terminals of dopaminergic and also norepinergic, sorry, noradrenergic neurons. Okay, they also release their monoamine neurotransmitter into the extracellular fluid in a non-classical synaptic way. Okay, and then they reuptake it using a transporter, but the transporter they use is different. So for dopamine, the specific transporter is the dopamine transporter. Okay, and for short, the dopamine transporter is abbreviated as DAT. Okay, DA for dopamine, D for dope. A for amine, and then T for transporter, okay, and SLC6A3 is then the transporter for noradrenaline, and it's called NET, okay, you might be wondering, well, why on earth is it called NET, okay, there is logic in the naming, okay, so basically, in America, um, they don't call noradrenaline noradrenaline anymore. Instead, there is another name for noradrenaline, and I should have said this actually earlier on, in case I've got American viewers, and I have a lot of American viewers. Okay, uh, so the other name for noradrenaline is norepinephrine. Okay, and now we can understand why this transporter is called NET. This stands for norepinephrine transporter rather than noradrenaline transporter. We'd think if it was to be called the noradrenaline transporter, it would be NAT rather than NET. Okay, so that's uh, another name for SLC6A3. So these are, if you like, the very, very boring official names, which are helpful for memory, okay, uh, because you know, if you had to remember 20 different names for the SLC6 members, that would be a nightmare, basically. Uh, instead, you can just remember that it's SLC6A and then 20 numbers after it. Okay, so that's the nice bit about that, that naming system. Okay, even though these names are a little bit boring, because they don't tell you what it actually is transporting. I should almost also say that the other members of the SLC6 uh, family of solute carrier transporters. Most of them transport amino acids. Okay, so you have a huge number of uh, members in this family that transport amino acids. You also have uh, transporters for the amino acid GABA. Okay, there are three transporters for GABA in this family. Um, and also things for uh, transporters for creatine and taurine as well, certain other molecules as well. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, back to the monoamine transporters, however. Right, so we've now seen that within this SLC6 family, there are actually transporters for all of the three monoamines that we've talked about, and we're not really going to need the dopamine transporter, so I think we will now stop with the discussion of dopamine, but we are going to need the norepinephrine nephrine transporter and the serotonin reuptake transporter. So I'm going to discuss these two in more detail now. Specifically, we'll focus on the serotonin reuptake transporter at the moment since we're in the process of discussing SSRIs. But when we come on to the other antidepressants, a lot of those are going to work by blocking the norepinephrine transporter as well as the serotonin reuptake transporter. Okay, right. So what I now want to discuss is what are the actual structure of these proteins. Okay, now, this is not particularly well understood, uh, but something is understood. We do actually know their membrane-spanning topology, so I'm going to tell you that now. Okay, so, let me draw the cell membrane firstly. Okay, so that these two parallel lines that I'm drawing here now represent the cell membrane of our axon terminal. Okay, so what I'm drawing effectively is, if this is our axon terminal here, and before I just drew the uh, transporter, let's say it's the serotonin reuptake transporter here, I just drew it as a blob in the membrane. What I am now doing is I'm going to zoom in on that. I'm zooming in on the membrane, and now I'm acknowledging that the membrane isn't actually just one layer, it's actually a phospholipid bilayer, so I've drawn both layers. 
Okay, and now I'm going to show you the structure of this protein, the membrane-spanning topology. And this membrane-spanning topology actually goes for all of the SLC6 family members, not just the serotonin reuptake transporters. So it certainly ex extends for our norepinephrine transporter as well as our serotonin reuptake transporter. But it actually goes beyond that. It goes for all of the SLC6 family members. Okay, so... We'll say that this is the extracellular side of the membrane, so this is the extracellular fluid, ECF here, and this is the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. Okay, right. Now, the protein begins with its amino terminus intracellularly. So these proteins, these transporters, they are one protein, which is quite nice. They're not complexes of protein, they are functional as a single individual polypeptide. Okay, so here's its amino terminus, and then this line represents a polymer of amino acids. It represents the polypeptide. So you're going to get the polypeptide spanning the membrane, and when it spans the membrane, it will actually be an alpha helix that it's using to span the membrane. But I haven't shown that, I'm just going to show it as a line. Okay, and it's going to span the membrane many more times. In fact, it's going to have 12 membrane-spanning alpha helices. So there's 6, 7, 8... 9, 10, 11, 12, and then it's going to end with its carboxylic acid tail in the cytoplasm. Okay, so 12 membrane-spanning alpha helices. That's one of the first things uh, to note about the structure here. Membrane-spanning alpha helices. Now, how does this thing actually fold up into a functional transporter that's going to be able to pump serotonin back into uh, the uh, cytoplasm. Well, basically, the first 10 membrane-spanning alpha helices are going to form the core portion of the transporter that's going to be uh, involved in um, moving uh, the substrate back into the cytoplasm. Okay, so... This portion here, these first 10 membrane-spanning alpha helices, so that's 5, then we've got another 5 here, okay, like so. These ones are going to form the main portion that is going to be involved in transporting the substrate back into the cytoplasm. Okay, whereas these final two here, which I'm highlighting in blue, these are not going to be involved in the main portion that's actually involved in the transporter. These are going to be on the side, and it's believed that maybe these are involved in the dimerization of two of these proteins together. Okay, but you don't need the dimerization for them to be functional. They are functional on their own, but maybe they do go around in pairs. Okay. But that's not known, so I've put a question mark there, but it's believed that, that might be the role of those uh, two membrane spanning alpha helices there. Okay, so let me draw a picture that's more functionally insightful then. Okay, so if this is the membrane, these um, ten membrane spanning alpha helices here in purple, those are going to fold up into something that's actually going to function as a transporter. So I'm now going to return this to being represented just as a blob. Okay, and then the final two membrane-spanning alpha helices, they're just going to be sitting on the side here, potentially involved in dimerizing two of these things together. Okay, right. So, let's colour this in. So, we'll have these membrane-spanning alpha helices here in blue. Okay, and I think I should have the amino terminus at some point, so I'll put that here. Okay, and then we've got the, ten, the first ten membrane-spanning alpha helices forming the transporter here. And at the moment, this transporter is in what's known as the outwardly facing state, which is why I've got this little pocket here, this binding pocket for, pocket for the substrates facing outward. So at the moment, we are in the outwardly facing state. Okay, right, so what's now going to happen is that a serotonin molecule, which I'll just abbreviate as 5-HT, is going to come and bind in this binding pocket here, along with two other things as well. You need one sodium ion and also one chloride anion. Okay, so you need a molecule of sodium chloride effectively to come and bind here as well. Okay, and this is how the serotonin reuptake transporter is going to work. It's not an primary active transporter, it's a secondary active transporter. It is going to transport the serotonin into the cytoplasm along with 
a sodium ion and a chloride anion, which will be going down their concentration gradient. Now, which is more powerful? It's the sodium ions that are, are more power, have the more powerful concentration gradient across the cell membrane. Okay, so remember, sodium concentration extracellularly is usually around 145 millimolar. Intracellularly, it's usually around 12 millimolar. Now, you also have to take into account the fact that the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is usually around negative 65 millivolts, okay, resting electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. That means that the electrical potential in the cytoplasm is 65 millivolts lower than the electrical potential in the extracellular fluid. Sodium ions, being a positively charged ion, want to go where the electrical potential is lower, which at the moment is in the cytoplasm. So both the electrical gradient and the concentration gradient are favoring the movement of sodium in. Okay, so it's sodium mainly that is driving this movement of serotonin into the cell. Okay, so this is what's known as secondary active transport because we are using the um, ionic gradient uh, of sodium to move the serotonin in. Okay, and the ionic gradient of sodium was built up by primary active transport on the part of the sodium potassium ATPase. Okay, so this is why it's called secondary active transport because it's really second to primary active transport of the sodium ions. Okay, so, so secondary active transport. So, what will happen then is a serotonin molecule will bind here, a sodium ion will bind here, a chloride anion will bind here, and then what will happen is once all that has occurred, you'll get conformational changes, and the, the, all of the things will be moved down in these conformational changes. Okay, so the mol you know, the protein will undergo a lot of conformational changes, and it will turn into what's known as the inward the facing state. So let me show this here now. Okay, so here's the inwardly facing state. And now once it's in the inwardly facing state, it will lose its affinity for all of these molecules that are bound. It will lose its affinity for the 5-HT. Okay, so the 5-HT will be released into the cytoplasm. And let me just move this up a little bit. Okay, it will lose its affinity for sodium ions, so the sodium ion will be released into the cytoplasm, and it will also lose its affinity for the chloride anion, so the chloride anion will be moved into the cytoplasm. Okay, so no ATP in sight anywhere. It's just used the energy released by moving the sodium ion from the outside to the inside to drive the movement of serotonin into the cell, basically. Okay, so that is how uh, the CERT works. Okay, right, so this is the CERT here, and it's a very similar principle for the norepinephrine transporter as well, and we'll come to that in a moment when we discuss the other antidepressants. Okay, right, so uh, to summarize then, the SSRIs, so the SSRIs, um, these drugs such as fluoxetine, paroxetine, sertraline, citalopram, okay, they will bind to the serotonin reuptake transporter on these serotonergic neurons, okay, and they will stop this function of the serotonin reuptake transporter in reuptaking serotonin from the extracellular medium into the axon terminal. So the serotonin will remain in the uh, extracellular fluid now and continue having its regulatory role, whatever that may be. Okay, so by giving these drugs, you are increasing the effect of serotonin. Okay, somehow that helps in anxiety. And as I say, we don't know is the answer. We don't know why that helps in anxiety. Potentially, it's nothing to do with this effect. We know that um, SSRIs do do this, but potentially the reason SSRIs help in anxiety is nothing to do with this. And I'll give you the piece of evidence in favor of that view, okay? Um, you see, the thing is, and that antidepressants, including SSRIs, actually take ages to work, okay? They take approximately three weeks to actually have any effect on the anxiety, okay? They do seem to have an effect, but they take three weeks to have it. Whereas, as soon as you give these drugs, as soon as you give these antidepressants, this effect begins instantly, basically. Serotonin goes up much, much quicker than, in three, than three weeks, basically, okay? So, if the anxiolytic effect was produced by the increase in serotonin, 
then why does it take three weeks to have any effect when the serotonin goes up pretty much the instant you take the drug? Okay, uh, that is a question and no one has an answer really to that. Potentially it is the rise in serotonin that is responsible for the anxiolytic effect, but the rise in serotonin causes changes in neural structure that take three weeks to occur. We don't know is the answer. Okay, but this is all we have uh, with regards to a mechanism for how uh, SSRIs work. Okay, right. So, uh, now let's go on to the other antidepressants. So the next uh, group of antidepressants I want to discuss are very related to the SSRIs. They're known as the SNRIs. Okay. And what does this stand for? This stands for serotonin, that's the S. Okay. And now the N stands for dash norepinephrine or noradrenaline. I'll put norepinephrine, okay, just to show winning. So norepinephrine, okay, so that's the N, and then reuptake inhibitors. So these drugs don't just block the reuptake of serotonin by serotonergic neurons, but they also block the reuptake of noradrenaline or norepinephrine by norepinephrine I can't really say that, noradrenergic neurons, uh, norepinephrinergic, I suppose is the word, norepinephrinergic, okay, uh, so they block the reuptake of serotonin by serotonergic neurons and norepinephrine by norepinephrinergic neurons, okay, which remember have their cell bodies in the locus ceredius. So these are going to increase um, the uh, levels of both serotonin in the brain and also norepinephrine as well, okay? And these two effects are believed to underlie their anxiolytic effects. And they also underlie their uh, antidepressant effects. Okay, so let me give you an example of um, uh, an SRNRI, okay? So an example would be venlafaxine. Okay, now, let me talk in a little bit more detail about the norepinephrine, uh, norepinephrine transporter, which is the thing that's also going to be blocked by these SNRIs. So we've discussed the serotonin reuptake transporter. Um, we understand that. We understand that blocking it, which is what these drugs will do, uh, will increase the level of serotonin. Okay, let me just make it crystal clear with regards to the norepinephrine transporter as well. Okay, so... Let's say that this is now a noradrenergic neuron. Okay, so this is a noradrenergic neuron. And I'm sorry for the inconsistency, but I will keep moving between uh, using noradrenaline and norepinephrine. Okay, right. Uh, so this is the axon terminal of a noradrenergic neuron, and it will be releasing noradrenaline, NA for short. Okay, it then has the transporter here known as the norepinephrine transporter, or NET, which will then be transporting the noradrenaline back into uh, the axon terminal. Okay, and this norepinephrine transporter, it actually is extremely similar to the serotonin reuptake transporter. It has the same membrane-spanning topology where you have uh, 12 membrane-spanning alpha helices, 10 of these are going to be involved in forming the main portion of the transporter, and the final two, we don't really know what they do, they stick out on the edge, and are believed to maybe be involved in dimerization of, the, uh, of two of these things together. Okay. Similarly, um, the norepinephrine transporter actually requires the same things to bind to it as the serotonin reuptake transporter. Okay. All that's changed is that the substrate, instead of being 5-HT now will be noradrenaline. So cross out the 5-HT, put noradrenaline. Noradrenaline will bind here, a sodium ion will bind here, a chloride anion will bind here. Then uh, the um, norepinephrine transporter will undergo a conformational change, move from being in the outwardly facing state to being in the inwardly facing state, where it will release the noradrenaline as well as the sodium and chloride uh, ions. Okay, right, and that's how you reuptake noradrenaline from the extracellular fluid. So, SNRIs will also 
bind to and stop the action of the norepinephrine transporter as well as the serotonin reuptake transporter. And in this way, they increase the levels of not only serotonin, but also noradrenaline within the brain. And this can also mediate regulatory changes in the brain. Okay, so those are also very effective uh, anxiolytics. But again, they take three weeks to work. Okay, now the final group of antidepressants I'm going to talk about do exactly the same thing as the SNRIs. Okay, they're just older, so aren't known as SNRIs. So these are old antidepressant drugs known as the tricyclic antidepressants. Okay, and for short, the tricyclic antidepressants are known as the TCAs. Okay, TC for tricyclic and the A for antidepressants. Okay, right. Uh, so these drugs, again, they bind to both the serotonin reuptake transporter and also the norepinephrine transporter. Some of them actually just bind to the norepinephrine transporter and block it from functioning. But the two that I'm going to give as examples, uh, again, bind to and block both the norepinephrine transporter and the serotonin reuptake transporter. So the two examples I'm going to give are imipramine, okay, and also desipramine, okay, desipramine. So both of these drugs are tricyclic antidepressants, uh, which will uh, block the activity of both the serotonin reuptake transporter and the norepinephrine transporter. Okay, right, so that now concludes our discussion of the antidepressants that are used as anxiolytics. Okay, and all of them work by increasing the levels of either just serotonin or serotonin and noradrenaline within the brain. And by the way, some of the other tricyclic antidepressants will just increase the levels of norepinephrine. Okay, and by raising the levels of these monoamines, uh, that then produces an anxiolytic effect in ways that aren't well understood. But we do know that these monoamine neurotransmitters, their role is in regulating the function of portions of the brain. So potentially they change uh, the function of the amygdala, they change the uh, structure of the amygdala and to reduce its activity that way. Okay, and therefore handle the anxiety. But it is important to note that these drugs take three weeks to work. Now, contrast that to the drugs that we're about to discuss, which are the benzodiazepines, which work in 30 minutes. Okay, so if you have someone who is having an acute panic attack and you want to treat them, these things are not what you would give. Okay, you would give benzodiazepines. Okay, and it's those that we'll turn our attention to in the next video.